ఎవరింగ్ that's a very interesting aspect uh, and those comparisons between jati purana system and the uh, uh, bond tribal uh, narrative origin narrative system sri simana spatari digaru is going to talk about thank you very much thanks a lot uh, dr nagaraj garu uh, for finding me uh, a suitable person to participate in such a learned uh, symposium where we have had uh, so far six talkers uh, talking about jati puranas uh, from various angles and dimensions and covering uh, it so well uh, that uh, in fact uh, i don't have many uh, things new uh, to tell here but only uh, relate them uh, to how jati puranas work uh, in conjunction with a so called tribal or adivasi society called the gonds or rajgonds of adilabad and how uh, uh, their narrator communities or their bards uh, provide a, a kind of enclosing system for the total lifestyle of uh, this community um, the gonds as you know are probably uh, the second biggest uh, tribal community in india uh, by tribe i mean uh, a community which lives in relative isolation many times in a forest area and uh, uh, which doesn't interact with the settled or the mainstream society very often and uh, in their hamlets or in their habitations they don't have the kind of stratified or differentiated uh, uh, professionally defined social structure which we find in indian villages so in in uh, in, a, in a sense it's a uniform community uh, doing the same kind of things rather more or less living in a certain isolated uh, forest area but uh, how came the gonds are spread in a such a wide spread area extending from chatisgarh uh, to madhya pradesh some parts of up to maharashtra to orissa and to telangana some of some gonds exist even in gujarat so this has been a great puzzle of how uh, one tribe extends over such a big area so then the question comes what what kind of a tribe is this gonds themselves uh, call uh, term themselves as koitur gond is a name which came uh, to be applied to them uh, probably by the muslims uh, uh, chroniclers in in the 15th century but gonds call themselves as koitur and the language they speak is koya uh professor christoph von fuhrer heimendorf who wrote uh, who documented the mythologies the kinship relationships and the historical progression of the gonds in adilabad area in telangana um he answered this question uh, in a very interesting way that whether you look at the um, gond communities spread over such a large pay area in terms of their ethnic features in their in terms of their cultural features in terms of their mythological stories which define them uh, or their festivals it is not uniform at all uh there could be very sophisticated gonds there could be gonds who have lived in the past as kshatriyas and still carry that kind of lineage and there could be uh absolutely uh primitive near primitive life which some gonds might be living the only common thing that uh, is there to define the gonds uh, as one kind of community or koitur is the language the koya language so that being one thing um in large parts of chatisgarh and in madhya pradesh 
and in Andhra Pradesh, in Adilabad, uh, and in Telangana, in Adilabad, in Andhra Pradesh, in the northern districts of Andhra Pradesh, people who call themselves as Koya, not Gond. Um, if you look at these communities, which have their own specific uh, uh, variations of uh, their mythological origins, we still find a common kind of a mythological structure, uh, but because of reasons of distance and reasons of historical time, uh, you find local variations and uh, any number of local variations uh, uh, as you move from one area to another. So confining myself to the, uh, the mythologies that are sung for the Rajgons by their two bardic communities who are Pardhans and Totis. The Pardhans probably form the 90% of the bardic communities of the Gons of Adilabad and the Totis form about 10% maybe. Um, the difference between uh, Pardhans and Tutis is that Pardhans have at home, they speak Marathi. Mar Marathi is their mother tongue. But when they perform from the Gond and when they uh, interact with their patron tribe, which is the Gonds, they do it in Gondi. Uh, the Toti bards uh, speak only Gondi. But there are other Totis who perform in other parts of Telangana, uh, who also tell stories to other tribes, and there they do it in Telugu also. So when we talk about the Adilabad area, Totis here speak Gondi only, and the Padhan speak Marathi at home, but they perform uh, for the Gonds in Gondi. Um, The Gonds here, uh, if you look at their mytholo mythologies and, and they look at their stories of origin, how the Gond community came to be, uh, the story that is narrated by the Pardhans or the Tutis to them is called Sadar Bhidi, which is the primary originary mythological canto. Um, so that defines how the game Gonds came to be and how a figure called Pahandi Kupar Lingu divided the Gonds into a set of uh, vertical gotras, uh, which the Gonds call as sagas, okay, which, is, which is in English or in anthropological terms is called a fratery, into a set of fratries, which is generally four fratries. But at, in, some other, in some stories, in some versions, uh, they say that Gonds are divided into seven fratries or 12 fratries. But in the kind of areas about which I mentioned you, in general, it is uh, four fratries into which Pahandi Kupar Lingu divided the Gonds. So he divided them into a four go god fratery, a five gods fratery, a six gods fratery, a seven gods fratery. So this is the uh, kind of uh, uh, numerical based division based on the how many gods or how many persons originally form, uh, were the originators of this vertical stream or gotra. Um, they have a creation myth which sounds uh, in its details in the way it describes the, uh, the origins of the five elements, how the world came to be created, a lot of parallels between that and what we find in the Vedic, Upanishadic or Puranic literature. Um, but uh, there is a long history uh, from the creation of the five elements, the creation of the geography of the earth, the different continents, the different islands. Uh, after a long history of many gods and many gurus, finally, uh, it happens that there is a lady called Kali Kankali who uh, gives birth to a set of gods. She gives birth to some thousands of uh, Marathi gods, some thousands of uh, Telugu gods, and a set of Gonds. But then she abandons them and goes away. Taking pity at uh, these abandoned children, Sri Shambhu or uh, Shiva and his wife Girijaya, uh, they took pity on them and they take them into their uh, shelter and they keep feeding them. Uh, 
While the other gods uh, are quite malleable and patient people, the Gond gods are uh, quite rowdy. And uh, they don't like the kind of food that they are being fed by Shiva and Parvati. So uh, they sometimes talk dismissively about the food they are, that is being served to them, which is not sufficiently non-vegetarian, which doesn't have liquor and things like that. So there's a kind of mocking attitude within the uh, mythological structure, uh, which probably comes from the attitude uh, which the narrators or the bardic community have towards their patrons, which is quite a common phenomenon in other Jati Puranas also. So the, the narrator or the bard, bardic uh, community person who is dependent on the main community uh, for his survival and for his food still has you know, this privilege of taking pot shots at them uh, while narrating the story. Uh, so then uh, Shiva or Sri Shambhu gets very angry and puts these gond gods in a cave. He throws them into a cave and then seals it with a rock. Uh, there are people who are connected to these gonds, uh, like a uh, 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 woman called Jangubai and a person called uh, Pandi Kupar Lingu. Lingu. Lingu and Jangu, these two people are very much worried because they are connected to these bones in some way uh, about where they have gone. So finally, they come to know that they have been locked up inside this cave and they have to be brought out. So at that point, uh, either a Pardhan person in the Pardhan narration of the myth or a Thoti person, a Thoti bard in the Thoti version, they also get associated with Jangu and Lingu. And this person, uh, either a Pardhan or a Thoti, starts performing with this instrument called Kikri, Kingri. Uh, I'll show a picture of that to you a little later. And then, uh, roused by this music, the Gonds uh, inside the cave, they get charged and they're able to uh, move this rock, uh, which is uh, put across the hole into the a cave and they come out. Having come out of the cave, they are no more gods. They, from gods, from pain, they become vain. So uh, now it becomes a responsibility of uh, Pandey Kupar Lingu to set the course of life for these wounds in the times to come, in the ages to come. So it is like an original situation. He has to provide them the land in which they will survive. He has to provide a, uh, a social system for them. He has to provide wives for them because they, all the bones are males. He also has to define their culture, the kind of songs they need to sing, the kind of rituals they have to perform. So all this is done by Pandipupar Lingu. So Lingu is remembered as the great guru of uh, the bone tribe everywhere. And Jangu is another person, a female, who also has been uh, primarily responsible for the Gon community to come into work. So it, it is as if in this story, there is no other human community. It is only the Gons that have come into existence. And uh, the world is full of water. There are different islands. So Pandi Kupar Linku goes, goes on a big journey and finds out a suitable land where the Gons can settle. And then he settles them. He divides them into different gotras, gives them a way of life. So this is the primary myth, mythology, uh, which actually tells the Gons where from they came, how they came to be. And because this is their unique story of their origins, they consider themselves as unique people. A unique people who came into existence into the world, this world because of Pahandi Kupar Lingu, who has, been give, who has given them a specific way of life, a specific moral system, a specific ethical system, a specific way of having music, dance, celebrations, and uh, who has given them all their musical instruments, who also gave, told them how they could do agriculture, what kind of crops they could grow. So uh, it's like a primary one progenitor person, uh, Pandit Kupar Lingu, exists in Gond mythology. Um, from there, after having provided uh, 
different kinds of areas where the four freighters could settle. The Gond tribal life continued and they expanded into different areas. So uh, when you hear this story in Adilabad, uh, you find that the geographical areas that are described in the story are all from Chhattisgarh and Madhya Pradesh, that area, the border area between Chhattisgarh and Madhya Pradesh. And that memory of that geography continues in Adilabad also. Uh, so we can conclude from the way uh, these stories are discussed, mythology is narrated, that the Gonds migrated to this area from Madhya Pradesh and Chhattisgarh, that area. So it has been a southern, southern migration of the Gonds. Now, uh, the kind of uh, social system, the kinship relationships, which Pahandi Kupar Lingu defined and provided for the Gonds, uh, create almost an hermetically sealed system because no uh, outsider can become a Gond. And a Gond who does not live by the rules, the regulations, the customs that he defined, Pandi Kupar Lingu defined for them, ceases to be a Gond. So uh, there's a great pleasure within the Gond community in observing these the various rituals that he has defined, doing the different kind of festivals that he has defined, the pattern for which has been defined by him, and uh, remembering them and addressing any other Gond by the pattern that has been created by Lingu. So for instance, you cannot marry within the same Gotra. So if a Gond meets another Gond whom he doesn't know, the first thing he does is to know, uh, ask him, uh, to which freighter does he belong? Does he come from the four freighter Gond or the five freighter or the six freighter, six gods freighter or the seven gods freighter? So if you are from the same freighter, then you talk to each other like brothers. If you are from a different freighter, you talk to each other in the manner a brother, uh, uh, you talk to your brother-in-law. So that would be more a humorous, hilarious kind of a conversation. Um, so this uh, uh, primary story of how the Gonds came into the world and how they have been provided with an exemplary way of life, a beautiful social system, a beautiful system of uh, music and dance and festivals uh, is constantly narrated to the Gond community or on certain occasions by their parts, the Pardhans or Prathutis, especially uh, at the annual festival of their great gods or the Parsapain. Parsapain is the creator god of the Gonds. Gonds are unique according to them because they have this creator god or this ancestral god called Persepain. So um, you have a Persepain for the four gods fratery, you have a Persepain for the five gods fratery, you have a Persepain for the six gods fratery, and this, you have a Persepain for the seven gods fratery as their first ancestral god. Although uh, theoretically they all merge into one uh, in the way uh, different mother goddesses merge into the Adi Shakti form, uh, these different uh, Persepins uh, can also be called as different manifestations of the same original uh, god of the uh, Gonds, their first ancestral god. Only thing is that uh, each fratery has a different uh, set of uh, shrines where they pray for them. And the Persepin festivals happen in, uh, uh, in the month of Pus, that's December and January. There, the Pardhans and the Thutis reside these stories uh, of uh, the creation myth while different rituals are being performed. Then uh, this story is also sung at great length at a, a death ceremony. Anytime a Gond dies, he has to be joined or his spirit has to be joined with his ancestral spirits, his forefathers, because the forefathers or the ancestral spirits are all around us. They're looking at us. They're watching us, how we are living, how we are performing the Gond ethic, whether we are living by the Gond ideology or not. So, uh, the completion of a person's life and his spirit or his soul happens only when through a ritual, his soul is joined with the souls of his ancestors. So a goat or, uh, is generally sacrificed uh, at this current festival and this whole narrative is sung. So while this primary uh, Satarbhidi is sung, then after that, that is after this primary history, which is common to all the Gonds, 
then there is a sub bhidi or a sub canto which has to be narrated which tells how within this fratery you belong to a different clan in each clan there are a set of fratries uh, which are which can be called as the family names so in four god fratery you have some 40 50 uh, clan names or uh, which are which are called as in gondi as padi so you have a saga and within each saga you have many parties so uh, the story of how this party came about or uh, this gharana came about is also told by sung to you by your bard so the bards also have the same kind of name uh, the same the bards also carry the same fratry name and the saga name to which uh, for the for the saga or the party for whom he performs so there is a kind of a division uh, location wise division or uh, um, family wise division uh, on which pardhan can sing for which gond so the gonds and the pardhans are also are equally uh, similarly divided uh, in in terms of the fratries and the sub fratries or the clans so this is a kind of a social relationship so uh, a gond uh, will have to call a pardhan or, or a toti who carries the same fratry name and preferably the same sub clan name to perform for his family or, or for his village whenever the need arises for the parsapin festival or for the karun or the death ceremony so these are the main uh, this is the main ritual function of the pardhans or the totis for the gond community but that doesn't mean that they are the priests of them the priestly function is handled by someone in the within the gond community itself so there is a hierarchical difference definitely between the gond community and their bards that is the pardhans and the tutis uh, the pardhans and tutis could not till recent times enter into a gond's home they had to stand outside the home but uh, they had a, an intellectual relationship with their uh, patron community so they were they have been the repositories of the entire mythical memory the lineage memory of uh, each person and each uh, uh, family and uh, they also played an important part in settling uh, marital relationships or um, doing certain functions when a child is born giving advice in terms of uh, whenever there is a social conflict when there are marital conflicts uh, so the pardhans and tutis carried this responsibility of remembering the entire gond tradition the value systems of gond tradition and examples from the past in terms of whenever uh, a dispute has to be resolved uh, so uh, in that sense the pardhans and the tutis carry a much more closer relationship a much more regular relationship with their patron community than what we see uh, within the jati communities uh, or the or the tellers of the jati puranas uh, because the uh, the bards of each jati they visit uh, their patrons probably once in a year or once in every two years and not so regularly as it happens within the gondi community sorry i'll just close this form yeah mm -hmm. so what's happening here the gonds consider themselves as a unique people a people who have a specific culture which has great beauty which has great egalitarian values which gives great importance to individualism which gives great importance to dance and music so they consider themselves as a set of blessed people a set of unique people that they have got such uh, they have had such great gurus in the past and who have bestowed on them such a beautiful and happy life uh, with which they can survive uh, within the confines of a natural setting so every uh, relationship between a fratry um, or a sub fratry and the natural phenomena for instance each fratry has its own distinct totems they have a their own distinct tree they have their distinct 
a bird for themselves and an animal. Sometimes this division goes also to the suffragery or the clan level also. Uh, without uh, this defining mythology, the Gons have nothing to fall back upon. It is it provides the very core of their existence. Hello, hello. Uh, so, the, uh, but that doesn't mean that uh, the uh, Pardhans and the Totis uh, keep reminding the Gonds uh, of these stories at every occasion. It is not just their function that the Gonds should be reminded of their own stories. Uh, the various songs which women sing at various occasions, uh, at wedding festivals, at weddings, at, uh, at the feasts for the gods. Uh, whenever uh, you know a child is born, so women women songs are a very big feature of every social and ritual event in uh, in Gon community. But uh, one can infer very easily that the songs which the women sing, or many Gons also know or have known till recent times, um, the primary uh, information uh, or the narrative has been provided always by the bards. What the bards, bards have provided that people remember, the women's convert them into their own songs. And so at every point in, in Gond uh, uh, life cycle, they have to, uh, somehow the originary story comes into play. Every time you have to remember to which saga you belong, to, to which sub clan you belong and how this saga came to be. So for instance, there is uh, during the Deepavali time, the great Dandari festival in which people dressed up in ornate, you know, uh, uh, makeup and, uh, you know, um, very ornamental dress and, and a huge peacock crown, men with their troop of uh, instruments and dancers and kolatam dancers or Dandia dancers, they visit another village and they greet them. And in turn, they are received very well. And at that point, uh, also submerged within the ritual pattern, which is a very extensive and very beautiful pattern of Dandari festival, uh, one can notice that the Gusadi uh, uh, um, god, people dress up as a Gusadi guys, some of the participants who are going visiting this troop, uh, who are part of this troop, dress up themselves as uh, Gusadi. And Gusadi represents the entire guru system of the bones. And so when these Gusadis visit another village, uh, everyone gets excited. Look who has come. The guru has come. The guru who has given us this beautiful festival called Dandari. So it's a kind of thanksgiving that keeps happening every time uh, within the uh, bone, the system of life that they consider themselves as unique and they consider themselves are lucky that they have this way of life. And so they have to thank their gods. And, that, and this is the way they have to propitiate their gods uh, whenever their bad times or good times. So if they propitiate their ancestors, the same way of life, an assured way of life will continue. So for the good, uh, sir, I'll continue in just two minutes now. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, can I show some photographs uh, which will illustrate what I have been saying? Yeah, yeah. Uh, all in two minutes, sir. Yeah. yeah. I think if they have downloaded them, no. Have they been able to download them there? Sir, we haven't received any photos, sir. Okay. All right. So um, now to uh, conclude my uh, talk, it is the kind of difference that you find between the regular Jati Puranas about which all the speakers have uh, spoken so far and the kind of uh, Puranas which tribal or Adivasi communities. One thing which I have said is that the, probably the relationship between the Puranas and the Bards is much more closer in, in tribal communities because the enunciation or the reiteration of who they are as a people happens much more regularly. Uh, much more frequently in tribal communities, as far as I can see. And there is a much more greater self-reflexive quality. 
they are not uh, in a hierarchical system where they have to secretly or within their community assert their superiority uh, as you find in jati puranas for instance uh, the, in jamba purana the madigas uh, within uh, assert in their own location that they are superior to every other caste or uh, within the perika purana of the potter community it is asserted that without you the whole society would not have existed so you are fundamental to the existence of the rest of the society so it is in relation to the uh, to the rest of the society that each caste or jati purana works apart from many other functions that it serves about which uh, the speakers so far have dealt with in such a beautiful manner but uh, in a in a in a tribal society because it has uh, not such frequent uh, interaction with the outside society or the regular village society uh, uh, till recent times it is a uniqueness of your own life it is the protection of your own way of life that is so important what happened is that during the british time uh, with their incursions into tribal territory uh, they took away uh, the special privilege which the adivasis as communities or as samaj uh, had uh, in in an earlier way of life in an earlier age of technology because to survive in the forest and to deal with the wildlife in the forest was a special skill of adivasis and the, uh, the the village people or the normal mainstream people uh, took this as the special quality or the special capability of the tribal people so uh, tribal produce from the forest could be bought by the villagers and you know certain things from the other caste or jatis uh, the tribal people also took them you know like implements like pots so there was some interaction uh, economic inter uh, interchange exchange also but then it happened in you know on this border on this border that we are dealing with you only at some points of time and not always uh, but then uh, with the invention of uh, with the entry of the gun culture and the fire power which came with the british the handling the wildlife became easier with the building up of roads you know people can travel into the, could travel into the jungle and thereby gradually the special capability for which the tribes were you know uh, given great uh, value by the rest of the society came down and there are many other aspects why uh, tribals who had such great pride about themselves had to feel very bad about who what kind of people they were or they were called uh, you know uh, crude people they were called uh, primitive people their culture was looked down upon but if you get into the mythology uh one can see that it is a sophisticated culture just because they're living in the forest doesn't mean that uh in terms of cultural sophistication in terms of moral systems in terms of the uh refinements they have in their music and dance and the, and, and the kind of a uh, total pleasure they get out of life and the value they enshrine upon themselves uh they are anyway less than us in some ways they are probably superior to the rest of the indian caste in this aspect i would say thank you oh the, on that wonderful wonderful note sunas uh, patigaru about uh, i'm sorry i i i i had sent some photographs probably if they could receive that yeah. yeah thank you very much uh, that was really such a very rich uh, material that you provided and uh, actually the comparison between jati puranas and uh, the tribal uh, origin originally narratives was already coming out through your talk people were able to see how because they already heard about jati puranas and how they are interacting with the mm -hmm. sanskrit puranas so the way you are bringing shiva and other uh, characters yeah 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 i think i think i, I should have emphasized this point that in terms of the, the way the mythologies are built up and the tropes they have uh, um, there is a great parallel you know without the rest of the puranas uh, adivasi purana for tribal puranas could not have existed in this form yes, so yes. Uh, there has been constant interaction at different levels we just cannot uh, define when it happened at what time it happened but uh, uh, a similar kind of uh, you know symbolic meaning 
If you decode the symbolic meaning which exists in many Jati Puranas, you find so many, you know, philosophically, um, uh, you know, sophisticated explanations uh, yeah, yeah. coming out of it. A similar, similar kinds of things you can easy, very easily find in Gonds and other uh, tribal mythologies also. And that is what has been happening in the recent period that there has been a kind of a great churning and educated uh, tribals, younger tribals have been trying to uh, find what exists in their own culture, what their mythology is, what defines them, and then reinvent and, and reposition itself in the modern period. So one, one last line of mine would be that the great uh, rediscovery of the Ghotul system of uh, the Gonds of uh, Madhya Pradesh and Hastar, Muria Gonds and Madhya Gonds, not, the Ghotul system doesn't exist here in Adilabad, but the Dandari festival of Adilabad could be considered as a, some kind of a version of the Ghotul system. A Ghotul system, uh, which has got such a bad name for the kind of freedom it gives young men and women to interact with each other before they settle on a mar marital relationship, also provided an entire system of education. It was a kind of like a, like a university kind of education on how to uh, handle and manage a society. Apart from providing you with the entire memory and the social basis and that knowledge to you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much uh, for all the knowledge. Okay.